Howdy, and welcome to Wise About Texas, the Texas History Podcast. This is your host, Ken Wise, and I want to thank you for listening today, and thank you for your interest in Texas history. Well, since the last two episodes, we did an episode on the Chili Queens of San Antonio and the bonus episode of Second Helping of Chili. We've had a couple of pretty severe cold snaps in the Lone Star State. This podcast is being released on January the 15th, 2018, and we're fixing to have another one tomorrow here in at World Headquarters of Wise About Texas. So that's great chili weather. I hope you were inspired by those episodes and got a chance to enjoy a big pot of chili, which of course I know you enjoyed with no beans in it. I want to thank everybody for the feedback on those episodes. We had a lot of fun with it. We got some good chili recipes circulating because of it and uh, hopefully inspired some of you to take your best recipe and enter some of those cook-offs we discussed. Well, I want to talk uh, today. I got the idea for today's episode from some information that was communicated by listener Cheryl Shaw, who is chairman of the Chambers County Historical Commission. Chambers County is just uh, in southeast Texas. The county seat is Anahuac. It is the site of some of the earliest Texas history. The Anahuac disturbances come to mind uh, as a result of the passing of the Turtle Bayou resolutions, and we've talked about that in some earlier episodes. And I want to tell you that Cheryl and her colleagues on the Chambers County Historical Commission do a tremendous job preserving Texas history. So uh, with a shout out to Cheryl, we're going to go back to sometime around the 18 teens and get wise about Texas. Now to kick off this story, we've got to start with the pirate Jean Lafitte. Now I'm going to pronounce it Jean Lafitte. Uh, I realize I did take French in high school and my French teacher would cringe, but i uh, I realize it's probably pronounced Jean Lafitte, but we're going to go with Jean Lafitte. He was born in Bayonne, France in maybe 1780, maybe 1781. We're not really sure. His father was French. His mother was Spanish. And we talked a little bit about this famous pirate back in the Champ d'Asile episode, Um, but we're we're going to expand a little bit on what he did. He, as a youth, moved to Hispaniola with his family. That's the island where the country of the Dominican Republic and Haiti now exist. Uh, He was in New Orleans about 1804. He and his brother Pierre were smugglers. They would smuggle goods from Barataria Bay to New Orleans. Now Barataria Bay is about 15 miles south of New Orleans and it's really more of an inlet. Uh, The entrance to it is blocked by Grand Isle, Louisiana. It's very marshy, lots of marsh islands and the word Barataria appropriately enough comes from the Spanish word to deceive. Well, Lafitte ended up in Galveston about 1816. Now, I'm going to leave some gaps in Lafitte's story because we're going to talk a lot more about him throughout the history or the the future of this podcast, I hope, and uh, perhaps a couple episodes just on the old Buccaneer. But he stayed on Galveston until 1820, and then he ended up going to Mexico, having been run off the island by the American government. Well, Jean Lafitte was a pirate, pure and simple, and pirates need crew, and that brings us to the subject of today's episode, one of Lafitte's men who came to be known as Crazy Ben Dolliver. Now, I have to start by saying that we really don't know all that much about old Ben. You can get on the internet, and you can find some articles written, and you can find some later articles written that look suspiciously like the earlier articles, but it's really hard to get uh, a lot of firsthand information about Ben, but I did my best. Um, some of the art, some of the articles say he was born in Georgia in the 1780s, but I confess I haven't been able to find a record, which would not be unusual in Georgia in the 1780s. Uh, but one account said that Ben grew up on a plantation of an uncle who mistreated him, uh, but there's no source for that. He's said to have joined a militia to pursue the Seminoles in Florida, and the problem with that statement is uh, if he really was of some wealth on a plantation, uh, why would he leave uh, to fight the Seminole Indians? But that's neither here nor there. More importantly, the first Seminole War, as is recorded in American history, was not until 1816, uh, and he would have been perhaps 36 by that time, maybe 30. Um, so there's nothing to say that there weren't militias chasing the Seminole Indians before then, um, but we don't know for sure. It's also said that he fought with Simon Bolivar in Venezuela in 1810, uh, and that this occurred after he had spent some years at sea. Now, again, that's unsourced, but it is worth noting that the pirate Jean Lafitte did receive a letter of mark from uh, Simon Bolivar in Venezuela, 
Um, anyway, it's thought that in Venezuela he met Jean Lafitte and joined his pirate crew. Uh, some say that Ben was uh, with Lafitte at the Battle of New Orleans. Now, I searched all the roles I could find and wouldn't find his name, but that's not necessarily unusual. Again, if he was on Lafitte's crew, he probably wouldn't. Uh, the authorities wouldn't have been in a hurry to record that. But we do know for sure that he was on Lafitte's crew. Several of Lafitte's crew, a former pirate crew, settled in and around Galveston. One of them was a guy named Charles Cornea, and another was a, one of Lafitte's premier captains, maybe his favorite, and that was a gentleman named James Campbell. And here's where Dolliver enters the picture. There was a story of the, a mutiny aboard Campbell's ship. Campbell commanded a ship called the Hot Spur, and Cornea gave the following account of something that happened on the Hot Spur and mentioned that he manned a gun on the Hot Spur with a Frenchman named Jean Calistre and a man named Benjamin Dolliver. Well, one night on the Hot Spur, a Frenchman named Duval organized his fellow Frenchmen among the crew. There were 14 of them for a meeting, and they were going to plot a takeover of the ship. The plan that they had was to ambush Captain Campbell at night. Duval made one mistake as commander of this plan. He served brandy to his cohorts. Well, when Campbell finally made it on deck, the mutineers were surrounded him, but they were all just stone drunk, and they started arguing with each other about whether to imprison him or to kill him. Well, Campbell took this opportunity to jump straight through a hatch on the deck and into the cabin in true pirate style. He passed out arms to the remainder of his crew, most of whom were Americans. They promptly got back on the deck and shot all 14 mutineers dead, uh, except for Duval. Duval survived. Now, one of Duval's mutineers did manage to kill two of the other crewmen, but in true pirate style, as the fight wore on, he got his head cut off with a sword. So you can imagine that was almost a scene from a movie. Um, so maybe those movies are a little more accurate than we think. We can always hope. Anyway, the plot was foiled, and Campbell attempted to bring Duval, the leader, to Galveston. They approached Galveston, and a ship sailed from Galveston to meet them, and Duval got a little nervous since the crew was now 14 men shorthanded. And uh, Campbell and the Hotspur would have been known to, be in, to have been one of Lafitte's ships. So they headed back out to sea. And Campbell soon thereafter decided the pirate life was not for him any longer. So he sailed the Hotspur back to Louisiana, uh, grounded her, and set her aflame, burning her and destroying the ship. And the crew was dismissed. Well, at this point, most of the men under Campbell seem to have drifted to New Orleans. Now, let me give you a little time period for this. This would have been after Lafitte had left Galveston. Lafitte went to Mexico and uh, eventually died there, although that's a big question as to whether he died there at all or where he died or where he's buried. But he and his brother Pierre were down in Mexico so his organization had largely, uh, if not disbanded, sort of drifted apart. So Campbell would have been on his own to a large extent. Um, so most of the crew, after Campbell scuttles the Hotspur, drift to New Orleans. Uh, but some came to Texas. Cornea came, uh, Charles Cornea came back to Texas in 1835 and joined the Texas Army and fought in the Revolution. As a matter of fact, he was part of the rear guard at the Battle of San Jacinto. Those are the men that guarded the baggage and took care of the sick on Morgan's Point. He lived in Galveston until at least 1909 because he was interviewed in both 1893 and 1909. So that was Charles Cornea. But what about his shipmate, Ben Dolliver? Well, Dolliver spent some time in New Orleans, we know, because there is a description of him in a New Orleans newspaper from 1847, and he's described as a, quote, little weather-beaten man. Uh, the paper went on to describe that his face resembled a mahogany wood carving, and that his nose was sharp and crooked and could have served as a boat hook. He's said to have had gray eyes and a matching gray beard. And one important feature on Ben's face was a six-inch saber scar from his right eye to his right ear. And many said that it was the blow from this saber, whenever it may have occurred, that caused Ben Dolliver to be a little crazy. 
Well, we know Ben Dolliver was in Galveston by 1846. How do we know that? Well, according to a newspaper, and, and I found this in an Austin newspaper, it was very common for the newspapers of the 1800s to print news from other cities in Texas. And so an Austin newspaper printed uh, some accounts of how Galveston was doing, and they said that Galveston was kind of a, a not-so-nice place to live because of the following crime report. And they talked about a couple of crimes. But then uh, on September, it says on September 10th, 1846, that Ben Dolliver was sent to jail for drunkenness. Now, the odds of two Ben Dollivers being in Galveston uh, at the same time in 1846 are pretty low, but Dolliver spelled his name with two L's, or at least history spells it with two L's, uh, and it was spelled with two L's in that newspaper. So I think that uh, it is likely that, that uh, on September 10th, 1846, Ben Dolliver was indeed uh, sent to jail, jail in Galveston for drunkenness. Um, so the New Orleans account of Ben's description was 1847. The uh, Galveston account of his arrest was 1846. So where was he? Well, we're not sure. Um, New Orleans uh, could have been describing him from way back. In 1847, he could have already been in Galveston, uh, or perhaps he went back and forth. Uh, I think it's most likely uh, that the New Orleans paper was uh, describing him from a time when he had been in New Orleans, but he had since moved. That's probably the most likely scenario. Anyway, Ben was known to be fond of his liquor, and it is said that he was absolutely crazy when he was drunk, that he would wander around, that he would rant about pirate adventures and pirate ships and chests of gold and would make no sense. So they started calling him Crazy Ben Dolliver. Well, someone else that had settled in Galveston was the former captain, James Campbell, commander of the Hotspur during that mutiny. He had settled on the north shore of Galveston Bay, just south of Texas City, near a lake called Swan Lake, and it's still called Swan Lake today. It's actually part of the bay. In fact, there is a Campbell's Bayou in that area, and that is named for James Campbell. And Campbell apparently would take care of of Crazy Ben when Ben went on an extended bender, pun intended. Uh, Campbell would take him home across the bay and let him recover at his ranch. Um, Well, that's all well and good. Uh, the old Lafitte crew taking care of each other. But what's so interesting about Crazy Ben Dolliver? Well, first, Ben Dolliver was one of the toughest people you will ever hear of. He lived on the north shore of Galveston Island on the beach west of the town in a wooden lean-to, wooden lean-to that was said to be insulated with sailcloths, and I think really what that means is covered with sailcloths. The citizens of town would report seeing him swim for miles in the bay and not only in the summer but also in the freezing winter he would fish in the bay for his food and uh, i mentioned his lean-to was covered with sailcloth but it was noted in one story that it was open to the north and the south winds now that'd make a lot of sense in the summertime but not in the winter apparently he didn't close it in the winter Ben never wore shoes. He walked all over the island barefoot, and he never really wore a shirt very much. He kept his pants up with an old piece of sail rope. So Ben must have been quite the sight. Um, Ben told this story himself. He once told Captain Campbell, and Captain Campbell relayed this many, many years later. He told Campbell that he was riding once in the Nueces River bottomland. Now, that would have been down in South Texas toward Corpus. And supposedly he was riding to the ranch of an ex-pirate buddy. The river had flooded. He rode as much as he could through the water, finally made it to an island. He said the island was infested with every wolf and rattlesnake in the area because it was the only dry ground. A norther then blew in, and Ben realized he was in trouble. So he laid his horse down, cut his horse open and gutted him, and slept in the carcass where he could remain warm. Ben claims that he slept one or two days that way, and he woke up when a buzzard was pecking at his feet, telling him it was time to go. Now, do we know if that story's true? Of course we don't, but I sure hope it is. It's a good story, for, for, and you can imagine the old pirate telling it. Somebody in Galveston once asked Crazy Ben how he could possibly stay warm and dry in the bad weather when he had uh, no visible means of support and not much for a home, and he said the following, and this is a, supposedly a quote, 
In ten minutes, I can dig a hole on the lee side of a sand hill, cover it with grass and bushes, and have a place where I can spend the night and be happier than any of the town gentlemen in their fine houses. Close quote. Uh, well, you can say two things about that. Number one, Ben was probably crazy. And number two, uh, he certainly had simple tastes, if he had any taste at all. But there was one more thing about Ben Dolliver that set him apart from the old pirates who had come to Galveston and set up a trade. As I mentioned, several of Lafitte's former crew had ended up in Galveston. Campbell, most notably, had become a fairly prosperous rancher on the north shore of the bay. A guy named Lambert, John Lambert, had become a butcher in Galveston. There was another gentleman, Stephen Churchill, who'd set up a ferry on the west side of Galveston Island. So they were all plying an honest trade. But Ben Dolliver, virtually homeless, wandering around half crazy and drinking all the time, what was so interesting about him? Well, here's what it was. He always paid for his drinks with a Spanish gold doubloon. Now, he was often shortchanged by the bartenders because he didn't really seem to understand what that doubloon was worth. Uh, but he also usually was so drunk he didn't care. But one thing for sure, he never seemed to run out of Spanish doubloons. In fact, he kept an old whaling boat, which would have been a small uh, rowboat, overturned near his camp and every now and then he'd ride it and set a mast in it and put it to sail in the bay and the citizens would see him tacking across the bay near Pel Pelican Island. He'd head toward the mainland and he'd be gone for a few days or even a week and then he'd return with a new supply of doubloons. Now nobody knew where he went but they did know that he never ran out of the Spanish treasure. Of course, they asked him where he got the coins, and here's what Ben Dolliver would reportedly say. He'd say, quote, that he, I get them from a big sea chest in the hot spurs bilge, close quote, which, of course, we know it couldn't be true because his former ship, the hot spur, was burned. But what was true was that Ben Dolliver had a source of gold. Now, we don't know what became of Crazy Ben. After Campbell died in 1856, Ben didn't come to town as much. Another of Lafitte's men, Stephen Churchill, the ferry operator I mentioned, offered to take him in, but he declined, preferring to stay on the beach in his lean-to. But there's a story that one day in 1858, a yacht sailed into Galveston with a young captain aboard who looked a lot like the old buccaneer Lafitte. In fact, this captain claimed to be Lafitte's nephew. And apparently Churchill met the young captain at the dock. He docked at Coons Wharf in Galveston which was at the foot of 18th Street, and the young captain asked Churchill where he could find Crazy Ben Dolliver. Well, Churchill led the captain to Ben's beachside hovel, and uh, the captain and Ben talked for several hours. They apparently returned to the wharf, rented a sloop, and sailed off with the crew, leaving only one man to watch the yacht. Well, some days later, Ben and his companions returned, and transferred two rusty sea chests to the deck of that yacht. Ben announced to everyone that he was going to spend the rest of his days in New Orleans, and as the Sea Rover sailed out of the harbor, that was the name of the yacht, the Sea Rover, Ben Dolliver stood at the rail, waving farewell to Galveston for the last time. So did Ben Dolliver know the location of Lafitte's buried treasure? For well over a hundred years, that's been a topic of discussion in and around Galveston Bay, and you'll see mentioned in several books, a lot of people looking for that treasure. As a matter of fact, a lot of times when Ben would leave his home in Galveston and go sail off to goodness knows where to resupply the doubloons, he'd come back and there'd be holes dug all around his little hovel with, of treasure hunters trying to figure out where he got all this gold. Well, we'll never know what crazy Ben Dolliver knew, but what we do know is the crazy Ben Dolliver never ran out of gold Spanish doubloons. Well, now we come to the part of the episode I call Getting There, where I tell you where to visit some of the places mentioned in the episode. The place I want to tell you about, James Campbell uh, died near Texas City on his place. He's buried in the Lamarck Cemetery in Lamarck, Texas. Um, he lived at an area called Campbell's Bayou, uh, which is where he would take Ben Dolliver. It's off of 145, or excuse me, I-45 and Highway uh, 197 near Swan Lake, which is really, like I said, part of Galveston Bay. 
This area is a very industrial area just south of Texas City. Uh, you can drive near it, uh, but the property is private. If you're driving south on 45 to Galveston, right before you get to the causeway, look to your left. You'll look, be looking past the site of Virginia Point and onto the old Campbell property. There was a Campbell Cemetery on the property, which is no longer there, and James Campbell himself rests in the Lamarck Cemetery in Lamarck, Texas. Coons Wharf, where Ben left Galveston with reportedly with his two sea chests, was at the foot of 18th Street, and today, if you drive down to 21st Street, you'll see in Harborside Drive in Galveston, you'll see Pier 21, where there are several restaurants. There's a little road called Wharf Road, goes down by a place called Katy Seafood, and down to the end, about the end of that road is where Coons Wharf would have been, and that's where Lafitte's purported nephew sailed in and spirited Ben Dolliver and the treasure off to New Orleans. We won't ever know where Ben might have lived on the north shore of the bay, but as you drive down Harborside Drive next time you're in Galveston, give a thought to old Crazy Ben Dolliver and Lafitte's treasure. Well, that wraps it up for another episode of Wise About Texas. Thanks again for listening and for loving Texas history. Please keep up the feedback. Uh, Wise About Texas is on Twitter and Instagram at Wise About Texas. There's a Facebook page. You can always email me with your ideas for stories at host at wiseabouttexas.com. I've got a little more information about Ben Dolliver than I'm going to share with the patrons of this show. If you want to support this show, you can go to patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com. If you'd like to support, uh, slash Wise About Texas, of course, if you'd like to support the preservation and promotion of Texas history. And if you get a minute, leave a review on iTunes. That helps other people find the show. I want to thank everybody who's done that. And for all the high ratings, I really appreciate it. I love doing this podcast, and I hope you love it too. So get out there and do something for Texas today. And until next time, God bless Texas, and we'll see you down the road.